Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Copenhagen Suborbital Rocket Shop uh, once again. We have some quite interesting stuff for you tonight, and I will simply just uh, start off with introducing Jop. Jop, you've been around here for a while now, uh, and people have seen you in some different videos and so on, but actually, who are you? And you're obviously not Dane, a Dane, so how, how did this come along? Well, I'm Jop, 22 years old, from Holland, and uh, I was in... CS for last year because I did my bachelor's over here, but I have a prior history of building rocket engines in Holland, so at least very crude one compared to what we do here. And uh, last year in February or January, I applied to CS if I could be involved with CS to do my final master, th uh, my final bachelor thesis for my study, and uh, I was hired. Mm -hmm. So since last year, I've been uh, almost working full time at CS on my own special project, about which we're going to be talking in a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's an amazing piece of engineering you came up with, and, and we're just going to go through this. Uh, but but before we, we start off with this piece, hmm. a bachelor thesis, it hmm. needs a certain scope. Uh, yes. you, we need to put something in front of you. Hmm. So what was? how did this one end up? Well, the thing <coughs> is, uh, CS has a history of using active guidance for their rockets. So as you know, if you have a rocket, it has a tendency to fall over during launch. So mm. you want to compensate for that. Yeah, we want to go straight up. Yes, for sure. Um, they've done it before using Sapphire, which had jet vanes, copper jet vanes, and has more recently flown like on Exo-1 and Exo-2 using uh, graphite jet vanes. Um, only problem with the system like that is that uh, because the jet vanes are being impinged by the exhaust stream, they generate a drag force which in maximum can generate about a drag of 10 to 15 percent, which is okay for the Nexo class because it has sufficient thrust for that, but it's not terribly great. So if you go have a quick look at Spica, the idea for the Spica rocket is to so-called gimbal the engine. So there's, as you can see, no jet vanes below it, but the idea is that we want to offset the thrust vector relative to the vehicle center line by hinging the engine mm. to the center line of the rocket. So if we're talking 10 to 15 percent loss, it would we would lose at least a ton of thrust on the speaker rocket. On the BPM 100, you would lose about a ton. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's that's something we don't want. That's unacceptable. Yes. So we do it like uh, like the grown ups. We gimbal the engine. Yeah. And this is where you come into to the picture mm. and this little uh, mm. uh, this little project because usually uh, these bachelor and, and master theses they are mm. sort of. Um, Let's call them analytical, yeah. academic. Mm. But this is actual hardware. Yeah. So uh, let's give uh, people a chance to, to get an introduction to what this is. But first of all, mm. just to reiterate, what was the assignment that we put in front of you? The assignment was to make a technology demonstrator for a, a gimbal rocket engine for the Nexo class of rockets. So for the Nexo 1 and 2 rocket, using that airframe and that propulsion technology, so the BPM-5, uh, had to create a gimbal design, mm. so gimbaling the BPM-5 rocket engine below mm. an exoclass rocket. Um, to make it more interesting uh, and also more applicable to Spica, it had to be made in such a way that the actuators I chose should also be scalable towards what would be representative of Spica. So you could not have, for say, small electric actuators which you could not use on a way bigger Spica rocket. So actuator technology had to be scalable. Mm. So. so that's also why some of this equipment is, is really beefy? Yeah. It's uh, mostly using uh, standard industrial components, using uh, which were supplied by Bosch Exode. Mm. Um, All right. So, well, uh, I'll leave you to go through this mm. one and just give a, a brief introduction on, yeah. on what is where and so on. So, so let's start at the bottom part. Yeah. Uh, well, as I think quite familiar to most of the viewers, this is... Uh, the latest iteration of the BPM-5 rocket engine is also known as the BPM-5RP. Um, what's different about this engine is that uh, previously the BPM-5 was made using metal forming uh, on the lathe. So the parts were rolled using a, a, a mandrel and a die to create the shape. Uh, this type varies in that by uh, having the engine bells being CNC milled. Mm. So the parts were uh, made or were outsourced and they were made into this shape. Um, 
So this is actually the last iteration and I didn't do too much on the design of the BPM5 because I already established before I came here. But I took the basic design of the BPM5 and some of the spare components we had around and I made a gimbal version of it. Mm. So what's different about this engine is that the fuel inlet pipes are slightly different and we have a redesigned lock dome. And besides that, there is an addition of a load cell, which I will come a little bit later. Right? Yeah. Okay, so a little further up, this thing has to be gimbaled. Yes. So how do you accomplish this one? That's where it gets interesting, because if you look at some of the amateur guys who do gimbaling as well on their similar size rockets, they have a so-called cardan joint. So you have the rocket engine, and on top of that there's almost like a wrist-type joint, which then has the, which diverts the thrust of the rocket engine into the rocket itself. Problem, because we have cryogenics on the Nexo class, so we have a liquid oxygen line and a fuel ethanol line. Um, I figured we could not do that standard approach, because if we had like a standard cadence joint on top of here, then the LOX line had to be routed alongside into the rocket engine, which would mean the LOX, side, LOX line would be on the outside. If you then were to gimbal the engine, you would have a huge strain and flex on the LOX line, which is at minus 180 degrees. And I think you know as well that's not really that nice of an environment for a flexible hose to operate in. Uh, it did make sense to try and sidestep at least the entire problem by, yeah. by then keeping the oxidizer line in the center of the assembly. We're online, yes. So what we actually uh, looked into is, is more or less a Russian design of a gimbal joint, which is known as a gimbal ring. It's quite difficult to see, but it's more or less the same principle as a Kadan joint. So there's two shafts at 90 degree offset, but the center of the joint is open. So all the hinges and support structures, the so-called yokes, they're mounted on the outside of the joint, and it's basically an open volume in the center of the joint. It leaves a tunnel for, for everything going in and out. That's, uh, that's exactly it. It's a pass through for the LOX line and the fuel line. So that, that actually uh, causes minimal fle uh, strain and flex during gimbal movement. So in retrospect, I think we could have built a Nexo 1 uh, or a Nexo gimbal using a normal Kadan joint. But if you start to look at a gimbal design for Spica, which propellant lines probably in this magnitude, you want to have a nice centralized LOX entrance. Mm. And that's also what the big guys like the Russians and the Americans do. So let's look a little more into the actuator system because yeah. uh, that's uh, also a bit unconventional. Highly unconventional. <laughs> but, um, as I said, it had to be a technology demonstrator for uh, uh, gimbal threshold control for the speaker class of rockets. Or for the Nexo class, but the actuators had to be scalable for speaker. Mm. Um, I did a, a bit of a literature study towards actuator solutions. And one of the rule of thumb stated for uh, gimbling an engine is that the actuator loads, the actuator loads required are about 25% of the en total engine thrust. If you then start to look at a, a BPM 100 a thrust level engine and you need the actuators for that, I figured it would be very difficult to get electric linear actuators to actuate a really big speaker rocket engine. That would be like two and a half tons. Two and a half tons electrical. of uh, of force, yeah. And they still have to be very fast response. And responsive with minimal backlash mm. and uh, you want closed loop system. Um, if you then look what, what ProSpace then applies is so-called EHA, which is electro-hydraulic actuators, which is actually a mix of the benefits of having an electrical actuator combined with the power density of a hydraulic system. Mm. So uh, in order to accomplish like this, this uh, actuator solution for my project, I teamed up with Bosch Rexroad, who uh, very kindly uh, employed some of their employees towards this project. And together with them, we came up with an actuator solution using EHA for this type of rocket. And uh, it's actually probably one of the smallest iterations of this type of actuator currently in the world. Okay, so the actuators themselves, mm. where did you put those? Um, to be a bit clarified about it, uh, we have two actuators. Uh, we have a hydraulic cylinder over here and over here, which are both powered individually by a pump unit over here and a pump unit over here. So they are two separate systems, basically? Yeah, the two individual uh, actuator axes. There's no crosstalk or no connection between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And the system operates by having a, a pump, a hydraulic pump, connected to an electric motor. That electric pump, of uh, the, the, the pump unit, outputs a hydraulic flow of fluid into the cylinder, which then actuates the cylinder. But in order to do proper and quite uh, 
precise actuator control, you want to have a closed loop of the system. So if you want to have a guidance system for a rocket, you need to know at what angle your rocket engine is. Uh, to close that loop, we have uh, two linear potentiometers. So as the cylinder extends, it gives a potentiometer value, and with that we were able to close the loop on the rocket. Uh, and then to enforce position control or speed control on this system, we use PWM, pulse width modulation, on the DC motors, which actuate the pumps. So you actually reverse the direction of the cylinder by reversing the pump direction. So it's a bit unconventional compared to airplanes where they have like a lot of proportional valves to, to redirect flow, which is a way of doing it as well, but it's a more heavier system mm -hmm. because then you have a central pump which has multiple proportional valves which control multiple cylinders. Okay, so well, this one looks sturdy enough. I mean, yeah. how much did you end up total mass for the system? Well, as we talked about earlier, the jet vanes, they generate about 10% of drag, uh, which would result into a thrust loss on the Nexo class of rockets of about 50 kilos. So initially, for my system specs that I was given, the system was allowed to weigh not more than 50 kilos, including the rocket engine. I ended up including all the cabling and connectors of 40.3. And I know it's still heavy, there's room for, for optimization, but knowing that it's done using mostly standard grade industrial components, I think it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. oh, no, no. Oh. And the best part of it, it actually worked. Oh yes. Uh, well, after having worked roughly for three quarters of a year, last October we had uh, quite a nice engine test of, the, of this system. And it was actually mounted in the well-known uh, test stand from CS, but it was different in a way that I had an additional bearing on top here. So the entire system was hinged inside the test stand, and then I connected a load cell to the side of the gimbal structure. So when we were gimbling the engine, I was able to get a load output of the potential thrust vector deviation from which I was able to calculate back the moment of, uh, the moment of torque around the CG of the rocket. Yeah, so you had actually more, you have several uh, let's call it axis of uh, measurement because yeah. the two load cells on the engine itself mm. measured the forces required or exerted mm. by the uh, by the cylinder the yeah. hydraulic, hydraulic system mm. but then again <coughs> the the engine thrust of course deviated and not uh, making an absolute measurement of that there was a second system that measured how it actually would have steered around yeah okay so it was actually, I used in total two systems to try to figure out the actuator loads. Because uh, there's also a big point that I found out during my literature study. NASA, ESA, all the big companies, they don't want to share any data on how to determine gimbal actuator loads. So I actually had to start from scratch trying to figure out how to determine those loads. Well, I have some baselines now, but mainly the load cell and the pressure inside of the pumps were used to determine the actuator loads. So you could have a force output here, from which I get a, a, a load sensing, but I also could use the pump pressure, because if the pump pressure is multiplied by the annular surface area of the piston, you mm -hmm. also get an estimation for the okay. force. So how did that 25% uh, rule of thumb, how did that hold up? Uh, not good. In which way? Uh, if you look for the BPM-5, using that rule of thumb, it would have been roughly 125 kilos. Uh, my maximum load because we only tested one gimbal axis because we couldn't do vertical, I had a maximum load on this load cell of about 27 kilos. So we, the, the system is way overpowered for... It's, it's way overpowered for the Nexo class. But then again, this is probably some of the smallest hydraulic iterations of this system thus far. So it, it is overkill, and, but it, it proves to work. There are, however, uh, uh, quite some issues with a system like this, and especially in the field of control engineering. I tried a little bit to do that, but eventually it was too big of a scope to actually implement it itself. But I've had the fair share of conversations with Bosch Rexroth when it came to, to that, because it, in fact it's the one big stick-slip system. Hmm. You have check valves which are spring-loaded, so the pumps have to build up pressure to, overcome, to compensate for the spring load, and then it's not as easy to control as electric actuators. Let's just put it at that. It's still uh, it's still quite an amazing feat because this came from uh, a design description, yeah. uh, a, a list of requirements, yeah. and then it ended up with this beautiful piece of engineering. Yeah. So um, I think you did really well, and it's been great fun having you around. It was uh, great having you as a mentor. Right, it was thank you. Fun.
Well, okay. Thank you uh, very much to Job and, uh, and uh, explaining all about his, uh, his beautiful piece of engineering here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you around soon enough. For further information about Copenhagen Suborbitals and our mission, please go to our YouTube channel as well as our homepage www.corpsart.com. As we're funded entirely by sponsors and donors, we need the support of our many fans to reach our goal of manned amateur spaceflight. You can support us by contributing through the support page. <laughs>